All right, the first thing I'm going to show you is how to create, uh, do a screencast um, or a screen capture video. And <clears throat> we'll go to this website called screencastomatic.com. Um, when you go to this website, you'll see this button that says Start Recording. When you click that, you get a square. And uh, the square that you get, I'm, I'm using right now to capture this video. Uh, you can resize the square to any size you like and down in the bottom um, you have options like uh, which microphone do you want to use, do you want to include a webcam um, and those types of things and then there's a red button that has a little round dot that says start recording and that's what I'm doing right now. Um, I'm going to use the Screencast-O-Matic to capture Angry Birds and uh, let's take a look here My preference for Angry Birds is chrome.angrybirds.com. Um, this is uh, mainly useful if you're using the Google Chrome browser, and that's what I use. Um, so anyways, you can see Angry Birds is loaded up here, and uh, I'll show you a couple of other things. You can see down here that you have several choices about things to do. Um, I think by default they, they give you HD. If you choose SD, um, I think things run a little bit faster. It'll be a little bit better for screen recording. So that's what I choose is SD. Um, otherwise, HD won't hurt anything. Just might be a little bit slower, uh, especially on an older computer. Uh, anyway, so I've chosen SD and I let the thing load. Now we'll go and we'll hit play. And let's take a look and see what they're giving me now. Oh, it's going to take a minute to load, so I'll hit pause while we're waiting. This is something you should do when you're making your videos. Oh, didn't have to hit pause. Okay, good. All right, so we'll go ahead and hit play. And uh, I think I've been working on poached eggs. I think that's the first one you get to try. You can see I haven't completed any other levels other than one. So we'll go ahead and we'll take a look at one. First, I'll reposition my... Uh, screen cap. Alright, so let's take a look. So here's my Angry Birds. Now um, I need to zoom out, so I'm going to go ahead and hit the minus key. Uh, if you don't zoom out, then the screen, the background's going to move, and we want to do this in such a way where uh, when, when we go and we launch this guy, uh, we don't want the background to move. And I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll put in several different launches just for the fun of it. And let's see here. Let's see if I can get one more launch in there. And I'm having some difficulty, so I will go ahead and pause. So after you use Screencast-O-Matic to capture the Angry Birds um, video, you need to hit Done, and then you need to publish the video file. Um, I usually save it to my desktop. And now I'm going to go into Tracker, and I'm going to go ahead and open the video file that I just saved. So let's see here, this Tracker video analysis software. Um, let's see here, I'll go under Videos, and... We should have one under workshops. There we go. And projectile motion. Here's the screencast. Um, so we'll go ahead and we'll open this. Now it's going to have a bunch of stuff that I don't need, but we'll get to the part where it has the Angry Birds. So here we go, there we go, so we can see the launch of the Angry Birds. So now once I get to that point, I'm going to go, I'm going to step frame by frame until I actually begin to pull back. And after I do, when I see the thing begin to go forward again, then I'll know I'm ready to begin tracking. So here we go. Okay, oh, there we go. So I let loose. So I'll go back a couple. There we go. I'll go back there. And then I'll say this is at frame 1605. So I'll go ahead and I'll go up here and click this button, clip settings, and we'll put 1605 in order to set that as the first frame. And then we'll begin to track the projectile. 
Now the way we do that is like such. We will um, go up to here and we will create uh, a new track, point mass, and then we'll come down here and hold shift key and then we'll click as best we can on the angry bird and we'll do and it automatically moves us to the next frame and then we'll keep clicking and tracking clicking and tracking clicking and tracking and I'll do this for as long as I need to um, I'd like you to take note of what's happening over here. We're seeing the data points as I'm uh, creating them. And over here is a little graph of time versus X position. Um, I'm going to go ahead and keep selecting this so that we can get the entire projectile motion captured. Here we go. It's looking good. It's looking really good. Okay, so I'm going to keep tracking. Oh, by the way, I'm uh, holding down the shift key to get this little box, and then I'm going to go ahead and click with the mouse. So the shift key gets me the box, and then I click to select the point. So I'm going to keep doing this, and this is giving me my projectile motion. Now, you might think it's a little strange that I'm getting that straight line in my graph, but check this out. I'll show you in a second what we can do. Let's get as much of that projectile motion as I possibly can. Um, let's go ahead and change this X into a Y position. And when I do, you can see, well, if I look at Y as a function of time, sure enough, I get a parabola. It's only when I look at x as a function of time that I get a relatively straight line. Now there's a few other things we can clean up here. Notice that at time 0, look at my x position and my y position. Uh, it, it comes out fine on the graph, but uh, I can go ahead and clean that up a little bit. I'm going to go ahead and uh, click on this button, which is going to give me the coordinate axes. And I'm going to go ahead and move the coordinate axes over to approximately where I'd like the origin to be. Um, I could have it be at the bottom of the slingshot, or I could have it be where I first fired the Angry Bird, wherever I want. Um, maybe at ground level. So if I do that, you can see that cleans up my, y, my initial Y value. That gives me a good Y intercept value um, that's reasonable. And uh, my X value looks a little bit weird for zero. Um, maybe we could go back and give it a little bit there we go so so that gives me almost a uh, almost a zero x value and then uh, a y value that's quite reasonable um, so that's the and I'll go ahead and turn that off we don't need to continue to see that it's still there and then we could also go in and add a calibration stick and I can make it so that the units are um, whatever I want them to be so for instance if I want this distance to symbolize a hundred yards or a hundred meters or uh, or whatever hundred feet uh, or ten feet I can go in and I can make that whatever I want but now that I have um, you'll notice that my X and my Y values have changed because I have uh, I've actually given uh, a scale here so anyways, now, now you can see that my graph goes uh, from at time zero, um, it goes distance x zero all the way up to distance x whatever it is. Um, so this makes things a little bit more interesting if we wanted to calculate uh, velocity and distance and all those fun things, height of course. Now, one thing that you could do is uh, you could have students do this on their own. It would be interesting to have students do this in, in a lab or as maybe as possibly as homework. Um, but another thing you could do is you could do this and, and uh, have students, um, you could give students some of the points. For instance, if I click on a particular point, it'll tell me what the X and Y value is. And if I click on another point, um, it gives me the X and Y value for that point. 
and when I have these two x and y points I can use them to get the equation of a line and with that equation of the line I could figure out what the slope of this line was and the slope of the line tells us what the horizontal velocity is and uh, you'll notice something interesting here um, it's not intuitive for most students to realize that when we have projectile motion we have uh, vertical velocity changes over time it gets slower on the way up and faster on the way down um, but horizontal velocity remains relatively consistent and that is that's true that's true of real phenomenon um, anyways uh, so but the other thing is is after we calculate what that is we can show students that there is an automated way to deal with this if we go to data tool analyze uh, we can come in here and we can go um, analyze um, curve fits and uh, we can see that because we only have this one graph, um, it's, it's trying to fit a line. See over here where it says fit name line? There's several choices, but the software has, has decided for us that, hey, this looks like a line. If, you want, if, you, if it was a parabola or something else, you could change that. Um, and, uh, and then it gives you the equation in the form x equals um, a uh, times t plus b. And here's the value of a and here's the value of b. So in this case, the slope of the line is a, and so the slope is 60. So if the units were meters here, this would tell us that we had uh, an initial velocity and a, a, a constant velocity throughout the flight horizontally of 60 meters per second. That's pretty cool. Um, let's go ahead. I'll uh, give me a minute, and I'll get set up so we can take a look at the parabolic portion of the flight. So let's go in and try to do a curve fitting for the parabolic portion of the flight. Um, one thing we can do is go back to our original graph and make it so we see the y component. And then when we do, we go back to view, data tool, analyze and then analyze uh, oh um, here now what we see is is we see the parabolic data and in and, and a line is going through it um, so I'm gonna go ahead and change that to parabola and when I do it fits that parabola nicely um, sometimes you might still see the the dots from the um, horizontal motion or the horizontal line if you do we can just go ahead and turn just uncheck these boxes and uh, in this case what we really want is um, we just want the, um, the, the the Y and the T data so we'll check the Y boxes uncheck the X boxes and again if we choose parabola as the line of fit here's our parabolic equation with Y as a function of T and our coefficients A, B, and C and here's the values for A, B, and C um, we can see what the Y intercept is which is a small value and uh, we can see uh, with, with A and B, we can do a few other interesting things. Um, you can use A and B to find the, um, the, the, the middle of the flight, um, the, 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 the axis of symmetry, uh, using X equals negative B over 2A. If you do that, you'll find the amount of time it takes to get to the very highest point of its flight. And then you can plug in that X value and compute what the Y is. And you can compare that with um, what we can see here experimentally. So we can compare, we can compare the uh, theoretical with the experimental data. Um, so there it is. Um, we can also figure out what the total range would have been um, if we know what the range is. Uh, well, sorry, with this particular diagram, we can't see the range. Um, what we can see is the time. So if we wanted to find the total time of the flight, well, we find the halfway mark using x equals negative b over 2a, and then just double that time, and that would give us the total time of flight. Um, if we wanted to, we could probably turn this into an X, and there we go. So we can see, again, we could figure out what is the halfway point of the flight and then see what the total distance of the flight would have actually been, as well as the maximum height. So there's a bunch of neat things we can do with this tool. Now, I thought it would be kind of neat to relate the, this uh, projectile motion to the Angry Birds, just because Angry Birds is something that... Uh, 
uh, so many students and, and heck for that matter so many math teachers were interested in this sort of thing um, uh, it's just fun to play games uh, however uh, the next thing is is let's try this with uh, a, a real video of somebody really doing projectile motion somebody throwing some object <laughs> 